Market Musings podcast with Fairbairn and Russell. Hello and welcome back to the Market Musings podcast here where we welcome back Doc Holiday again for another chat, another podcast. Doc, how are you doing? I know you've been a little bit more active recently. You're doing your Twitter spaces fairly regularly and uh, your podcast is back, the famous Doc's podcast and all the uh, little lines that you come out with, little innuendos, which are quite amusing, I think, to a lot of people. So how are you doing? I'm great, thanks. It's good to be back. Um, yeah, again, and yeah, activities increased in the markets we've seen an improvement in liquidity and we'll pr- pr- talk about that in a little while um but yeah back doing the podcast and trying to limit the amount of uh the time that i put into this but definitely think uh it's worthwhile and good reception and i think it you know it, it, it requires listeners and an audience mm. to to engage in and to, to help me promote it because uh, i do absolutely nothing really other than record it and hope for the best so um, yeah, I'm super grateful for everybody in doing that, and and it's it's really starting to pick up. The, the Spaces Live is is super interesting. Yes, your Spaces Live is every Tuesday, isn't it? I always mean to join, but something usually crops up, and I either forget or or I'm busy doing something. But I will try to uh, I will keep trying to join your your lives. Eleven is it? Eleven ten o'clock UK? Is it quarter to ten? Nine forty five? Is it? It's nine forty five. Yeah. yeah, quarter to ten Tuesday. Normally every Tuesday, nine forty five, unless stated otherwise. <laughs> Um, mm-hmm. It is kind of designed for a bit more of a sophisticated audience. And what I mean by that is I've got a lot of people saying, oh, can you record this so I can watch it back? And, mm. and I don't record it. And, and I get asked, you know, can you do it on an evening because I'm working? Yeah. And, you know, my response is there's a big audience of people that have been doing this full time and been through a pretty damning 12 months. Um, and I think there's perhaps even the, you know, the most hardy and, established traders have, have struggled over the last over the last 12 months as well so it's really for those guys to just share some experiences voice some of the concerns maybe you know echo the um the lack of uh, uh you know spark they've got for the market i think there's been a depleting enthusiasm for oh yeah for um for, for, for investing and trading from you know even from like i say some of these solid long-term guys. So it's just to try and bring everybody back together. And I think, you know, talking about the experiences that we've had on our journey, I mean, of course, if we came into this in 2020, um, you know, hit the ground running, potentially made a fortune, and mm. then I would argue you've given quite a lot back. And if you're still hanging in there and, you you know, you're looking for divine inspiration or perhaps just a, a, a few sort of words of, words of wisdom, and not just from yourself, but from a... a you know, plethora of different characters, then it's a place to be. And of course, I still do the podcast on a Sunday where I rant about Sam Smith and, uh, unfortunately, and generally talk about uh, the trading week. So, yeah, Good. Bit, of, bit of everything for everyone. Well, hopefully, we can touch on some of those things today. So, your uh, Twitter spaces is more for more of the sophisticated investors. So, I guess we won't be seeing Kenny there very much, will we, Kenny? Well, uh, good to speak again, Mike. Ooh. Actually, you're wrong, Mark. I, I have appeared. Uh, on you have? Field. Oh, you've beaten me? Yes. Oh. I've been there. I've been there twice. But I need to have a word with Mr. Musk because... Uh, yes, Mike, it can be a bit temperamental, can't it? Yeah, yeah. Mike can never see me. And he, he asks for questions. And I've, I've been raising my hand like an impatient five-year-old for like an hour and an end. He's never, yeah, it's not really, once... You need to request to speak, though. That's the thing. There's a little icon you have to request to speak. Oh, and if you... I did. Oh. I don't know. There's but you something... have to also. This is one of the biggest complaints to get. Is oh, I can't make it work. Um, I, I know one guy said I, I can't make it work. And I said, well, you know, have we gone to the settings on your phone and allowed Twitter to access your microphone and all this sort of stuff? Oh no, no, no. no. It took him four weeks to work it out. Um, and then it was great because he, he shared with the group, you know, how it, how it all played out. And look, I'm a bit of a technophobe, so man, you'd probably be fantastic at it. I'm 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 pretty shy. And because I'm in, in, in Cyprus, I, you know, the, the signal can drop, you know, temporarily from time to time. And if I don't have a co-host, what ends up happening is um, I'm stuffed. So at the, the last week, Dave Burton, you know, threw his hand in the hat, mainly because there was nobody else, uh, because Dave can, you know, whine on a little bit. Um, yeah, he was the co-host. And hopefully next week it'll be somebody different. Um, although I do love David and, and his contribution is welcome. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good, uh, that's a good format. And, I give me a nudge tomorrow, um, Doc, and remind me 
because I'm terrible as well. And I will have a look uh, at my, my microphone settings because uh, I was desperate to speak that that particular week, and you just you just ignored me just because I'm from Scotland or up north. You just just ignored me. <laughs> but to be honest, there's normally a bit of a shortage of people who've got the have got the kind of uh, you know the the charisma uh, uh, to step forward and and to speak. And there's been a nerves and. No, I had the uh, risk 29, I think, her ideas. And she spoke once last week. Uh, she asked a question, and then this week she came on and gave a suggestion and an idea and become a talking point for about five or ten minutes. Alan Green was actually on there as well, and he was quite familiar with the story. There's a bit of a three- and four-way chat on on mm. um, on a company, and, you know, that company has had, well, the shares have gone up by 20%. And not as a direct result, it's because the release news, which has been quite encouraging, but it certainly pegged it on the map. You know, I think there's a lot of people looking at it after that. Um, so it was useful. And one of the things that I've really found is we've been highlighting and talking about, you know, different companies, rationalizing those those thoughts uh, or applying some of the sort of mechanics of how each individual sees the market. And then, and then actually, you know, putting it into practice and we've seen great results you know we've seen loads of companies either release news and then we've got an understanding of it or we've seen you know been able to sort of thrash out some of the ideas about you know why we would invest in that company or why we perhaps wouldn't invest in it and then to go and see some of those companies go up you know exponentially as well and it's not kind of people just buying it because we're talking online you can see this it, it's happened over a couple of weeks it's happened because there's been some form of stimulation uh, and it's it's been quite useful because then we can go back and talk, you know, a bit about why Audio Boom went from 400p to 600p, and of course there was an opportunity to de-risk it and book some gains. And it's, it seems quite, yeah, it seems to be going well at the minute, but I'm sure at some point it'll go horrifically wrong. Uh, and there seems to be an absence of of dickheads, but I'm sure at some point they'll they'll pop up too. Yeah, I was just I was just going to ask. I mean, you've obviously. You've toned yourself down in the, the second coming. Can I call it the second coming, Doc? I think, I don't know, if you're, you're as old as me nearly. You must remember the Stone Roses. and they had a, Yeah, yeah, of course, one of my favourite bands, yeah. Uh, they, had a, they had an album called, I think it was the second coming or something like that, uh, when they come back. Uh, so what's happened to your swear box then? Have you had to throw it in the bin? Because you seem to be very well behaved. I know. I, I just think it's uh, I finally started to mature. You know, maturing in my mid forties. I was a bit late, uh, but yeah, it seems like I'm getting there. And I think I actually went for a couple of uh, a couple of pints yesterday, with, uh, and I'm, and I've got one of those uh, electric cigarettes as well now that, that doesn't have any nicotine in. It. And I don't particularly smoke a lot, but I do quite enjoy a cigar from time to time when I have a when I have a pint. But now I'm on this uh, little electric puffer, and it, it, people say they last a week. Or two disposable. Well, this seems to be about six months old because it gets so little use. But yeah, you know, I'm cleaning up my act. I think it's uh, it's it's long overdue, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you're you're, you're fast approaching that, <laughs> that fifty milestone. Unfortunately, I I had that hurdle last year. So uh, yeah, it does get you <laughs> thinking a bit. It's a, it's a bit weird, you know. You go, I remember when I was I was twenty six, twenty seven. How did I get to fifty so quick? It just it just shows you how quick the life goes and. Especially in the investing world as well. Sometimes yeah, for sure. Heads buried in it. You know this as much as anyone, Doc, when your head's buried in investments and opportunities and business. Like, there's no weekends anymore. A day just becomes a day, and the weeks just quickly. You've got to be disciplined, haven't you? You've got to kind of be disciplined and, and say, look, what do we want out of this? Well, I'm prepared to give up two to five years of my life and work me absolute conkers off, you know, 12, 15 hours a day, maybe more, um, six, seven days a week, eight if we could if we could invent an extra day. Um, but, you know, when I get to, 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 you know, achieve my goal, then I am going to make sure that I enjoy it. And I see so many people that have been around a long, long time that have made a lot of money and they've got the nice cars, boats, houses, everything else, and they don't seem to enjoy it. So, you know, I've, I've had a period where I've gone from, you know, one extreme to the other and we're just trying to find a balance that works for me. And I think while the markets are, have kind of spiced up and picked up a bit, I'm happy to be here. And I think if they go horribly wrong or become particularly boring or uh, perhaps, you know, I uh, exhaust myself with the audience, then maybe yeah. I'll uh, I'll sail off back into the sunset. But, you know, I even had your mate Jason Brewer on the phone 
Uh, he joined the spaces last week and I gave him a pretty tough time of it. And I've got to say, he come over really well. So, you know, we've had some interesting chat on there. We've had some people who come on and, you know, fought the corner as well when they've yeah. been called out or there's been some suggestion. And I've got to say, you know, Jason, don't ever trust him with me life savings, but he definitely come across really well. And I thought, he, you know, he definitely um, seemed to be able to, you know, present. Yeah. Were you not a big fan of him then to begin with, no? Do you have um, some reservations? <laughs> Well, I think, you know, I think if you drink from the devil's goblet at some point, you know, you, you, you either become satanical yourself or you, you, you know, you expire. And, and, you know, Jason's just kept a bit of bad company over the years, should we say, and it wouldn't take you more than five minutes on Google to work that out. But arguably, um, arguably, you know, that's behind him. And, of course, you know, his ex-business partner might have been a little bit dishonest, but he's as clean as a whistle, and that's fine. Okay. I accept his, uh, I accept his, 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 his comments because at the same time, you know, I'm not judging jury in life. Um, I've just got opinion based on the information that's freely available. Um, like I say, you know, not to be too judgmental. I think he come across really, really well. Um, and, uh, yeah, he, he gave us the update on Marula, and we chatted for about, Five or ten minutes, and I thought it was—I thought it was good. And it—and it goes to show, uh, you know, a few years ago, I, I might have been, you know, unable to sit and have that kind of dialogue. But as time's gone on, and I feel less obliged to um, force my views, should we say, down the throats of others, unlike some other market commentators. So I'm quite happy um, taking it easy. I mean, he does yeah, seem to. Every time I talk to him, he does. He's always done what he says he's going to do with Marula. You know, he says he's going to do X, and we come back on. The next time we speak, and he's done it. I mean, he does seem to be delivering what he says he's going to do. Um, and let, well, I think let's see what happens. I mean, they're supposed to be getting into production, aren't they, in lithium with those stockpiles very soon? The trucks are supposed to be arriving very soon to take away that initial uh, ore for sale, uh, and then it's uh, onto onto mining some or getting exploring the hard rock. So, I mean, so far from from him, I've uh, as I say, every time I've spoken to him, he's done what he said he was going to do, and investors seem pretty happy. So let's, uh, I think, let's see see how he goes. Yeah, yeah, and they've had a decent run in in, mm. in the share price, even on the Acris, which is an achievement in in itself. And yeah, and I, I credited him with that as well. So moving over yeah, quite soon, no, I think, aren't they as well? Yeah, I'm sorry, what was that, Matt? So they're moving over to the main soon, aren't they? Didn't you say that, Kenny? This morning to me, uh, in market, they're hoping. I, I think probably to end of Q two, uh, end of Q one, beginning of Q three. No. Done, End of Q1, beginning of Q2, and they're looking to move across. So basically, at some point in the future, they're going to move over, but hopefully sooner rather than later, I think, yeah. is the message from Kenny there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they have engaged. There's, there's been a few RNSs out about it, so the process has started. So, yeah, good luck to them. Certainly I think the thing that I'd actually said, and just, you know, just to be clear, the comments that I'd made were that he'd done a couple of these interviews, probably with yourself as well. I'd seen a few different bits and pieces. Um, I think maybe it was with yourselves and it, it commented, you know, about how fantastic everything was. And of course the price was going gangbusters back end of last year, really this year. And then they go and do, a, you know, a, an equity issue at 3.5 or 3.75 P uh, when the shares were trading at five, six, seven. And then the comments that came out in the, that I, I then looked back at the interview, he, he said, well, you have to be good to your word. If you give your word to people, you have to be good to it. And we've been having these discussions since October or November last year. So my argument was, well, if, you, if you're one of these secondary market buyers uh, and you don't really need a big secondary market on Aquis, particularly if you're looking to go on to AIM, how do they feel now if they've seen all of this promotional stuff coming out and all this positive news, knowing that before any of that happened, they'd already sat around the table and you know broke bread with financiers and, and, and discussed the price at that level? You know, When the shares are five and six P and you're still talking it up, or promoting it, isn't there a point where you just kind of say, hey, I tell you what, guys, let's do this next week, get the funding out of the way, and then we can really get behind it. Because I just think that's where this question of integrity comes in. But then the argument is, is as a director, it's your job to try and minimise dilution. And if that's if that's the way you've got to do it, that's the way you've got to do it. So again, not bashing anybody here. I thought it come across great, but uh, yeah. That was that was the, the crux of my, my uh, argument, well, if, if, if there was one. Yeah, listen, it's good to get CEOs coming on your your, your spaces. You know, if you lined up a hundred, you would probably get one or two that would have the the, the the balls to come on and actually engage. So yeah, and look, Hazelwood's been on and he's been talking a bit about his thing. And you know, I'll be honest, I you know I like Darren and know Darren. I've met him numerous times. 
um, over a lot of years, and uh, it's same treatment. So you know, there's no, it's not like anybody's holding any, you know, dragging them over the coals or holding the hands in the fire. But it's almost a case of let's look at both sides of it as much as we can. And I, and I don't think there's many other platforms that allow you to do that. And you know, one of the things that I've seen a lot of is I've seen other, um, you know, platforms that do these interviews and they start talking about EBITDA and, you know, future financial runways and all that five years down the track, this will be doing 80 million a year. And you just know it's all cock and bollocks. And, you know, actually in these interviews, nobody ever talks about risk. And uh, look, it's not, you guys do a great job, but this is a, this is somebody outside of <laughs> outside the stock box and, um, you know, Fairburn and Russell, this, this is another, and I don't want to start, you know, slagging anybody off, but all they do is talk about what, what could happen in three years' time and then not talk about any risks that could happen tomorrow, next month, next, or next year. And I just think it's it's creating a really false narrative. And, you know, I think if you come on and you're a bit more honest, you, you build a good relationship with the market, uh, you create integrity. I don't think investors will, you know, hate you. If you give them a bang for the book and they understood the risk, I think they'll hate you when they think they've been massively deceived, misled, uh, and expectations have not been managed. So may, hopefully we can do a bit more of that uh, as time goes on. But, you know, it's all just a bit of fun at the minute. Yeah, yeah. And it's free at the moment. I don't know how long it'll be before Mr. Musk decides to, to charge for it. But uh, I'm sure he'll add functionality to it over time as well because he, he seems very proactive. So he does on Twitter. Uh, yeah, it's definitely. He knows how to make a, a dollar or two, doesn't he? I'll, I'll oh, yeah. Nice. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 He had a cracking tweet the other day. Uh, it was, uh, I don't know if you've seen it, it was uh, it's two girls, kind of semi scantily clad, and one of them was on their knees, and the other girl was pouring milk into her mouth, and it was. Uh, the girl that was standing up was Ellen Musk's tweets, and the girl that was kneeling down was. Uh, but it was really, it was really weird. I don't know what the message was in there, but I was like, that's really close to the bone. But he gets away with it. He's one of these guys who can people expect, you know, that kind of stuff from him. Uh, you would have probably get banned. He's a bit of a fucking oddball, let's be honest. I mean, yeah. you know, one of the things I'll say is he's just a bit strange, that guy. But one of the things <laughs> that is really giving me a lot of inspiration is, you know, he introduced that thing now where you can you can see everybody's analytics and statistics so that was super revealing i remember just I, I, was, I was watching it for a couple of weeks and i thought you know what i'm going to put this podcast out come back see what interaction it gets and then i'm going to look at it versus all the other people out in the market and honestly it didn't take long to start eclipsing everybody else that was out there and i thought god you know how poorly followed are you know again don't start naming names but some of the mainstream ones that i was thinking geez, they've just done a roundup on 12 companies for the end of the year, and it's been terribly received. And then I looked at companies who've done a, a, an interview with one of the darlings of 2022, you know, or whatever, and, and the stats were terrible. And I was like, you know what? These fucking people have had these clever marketers and clever productions bullshitting the retail. They've been bullshitting the, 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 the small cap markets that this is where it's at. You should be with us and not with you know, perhaps some of these other up and coming you know, providers like yourself who do a great job. And I looked at it and I was thinking, if you're if you're a CEO of a name company and you're not aware of this, you need to be aware of it because the people that are actually getting out there and, and, and reaching an audience are not the people that you're paying huge amounts of cash to. I can tell you that for nothing. So either start paying me and you more, <laughs> which, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm, I don't think anybody would ever complain if, if somebody wanted to throw me a load of cash to, to, to talk shit all day, I mean, I'm happy to do that. But unfortunately, no, nobody does um, at this point. But, you know, or stop paying these bloody uh, providers that are charging 10, 20, 30, 50 grand and then getting no interaction, not getting you out there. And that was Elon Musk who brought that in. So if you've not been following it, start looking at some of the statistics mm. and analytics, you'd be blown away. And it's given me a huge amount of fuel to come back because it's kind of like, well, now everybody knows that when you when you know, when I was looking on YouTube and at some of these videos and it was saying, yeah, uh, 15, 1700 views, I knew that was horseshit because I knew some of these companies only had like 50, 60 shareholders mm. and they'd literally just come to market. And I was thinking, there's no way on day one that you just got fifteen hundred views. But I, I couldn't work out how the bots work. There was no way of exposing it. Musk's done it single handedly. So has, it's yeah. great for me and it's probably great for you as well. So yeah, long it is, may it's, that it continue. Is, it's it's very good. Yeah, you can see very clearly all the stats there on Twitter now. And you're right, a lot of people 
I don't know how it works, whether there's, there's sort of bots on it or you can pay for a lot of stuff these days, you know, particularly on YouTube to promote stuff. Um, that's something we never do. Um, we never will do. Um, and uh, you can just tell, you know, our organic growth, not that I'm, I don't like to blow my trumpet too often or stop boxes trumpet too often, but our organic growth is, uh, is built as quite a solid foundation compared to some of the other more fluffy folk out yeah. there, let's say, who have effectively paid for it. And you can you can you can just tell by the, the numbers that things get and and how they uh, they get their numbers. Um, there was one particular interview I'm not going to name it, but we were eight hours after this particular interview went out. We put our interview out, and we got more views in an hour than they got in the whole of the day. Whereas supposedly this this particular outfit has got um, a lot more subscribers, a lot more followers. Well, I'm not sure I believe that really. Um, I think our, our followers are well, probably more real. I'll be honest, you know, the, the, these people have been pulling the wool over the eyes of of, uh, of, of companies and the, the secondary market for years. These PR companies are an absolutely busted flush, waste of time. There's no integrity or very little integrity. There's not much in the way of honour amongst thieves. And I believe that these guys have been you know, Dick Turpin had the courtesy to, to wear a mask and some of these guys haven't. They've been found out. They're going to get found out. Some of these bigger platforms are going to go belly up. Some of the bullshit and con artists that are coming up, coming in, are going to get exposed fast. And, uh, and and yeah, long may, hey, long may stop, stop box carry on as well because I think I think you do a great job, lads. And, you know, I, I do a few of these each month and, you know, always been always been a big supporter of what you're doing. And long may it continue because, uh, um, yeah, it's... it's, it's, it's go on. Yeah, I was going to say, what we're trying to do, Mike, is uh, we're just trying to do things a wee bit differently. I mean, we've started doing sort of live Q&As in, in Telegram. Uh, I think we've probably done about seven or eight of these now, Mark, and I think, you know, we're starting to get a bit of traction for that. And there's a totally different feel. Yeah, you don't get, you know, 500 people joining the Telegram call. You know, you maybe get 50 or 60 people, but it's 50 or 60 people that are interested in that particular company. You know, everybody behaves. You know, it's not a rabble. You know, we, we're in control of all the, the mics and things like that. So it's, it's very organised. And, and the, the CEOs of Epidon, you know, give honest answers to some sometimes quite difficult questions. So it's it's a format we're trying to explore a bit further as well. I know you're not a big fan of Telegram, Mike, but at the end of the day, it's just another version of Twitter Spaces in a different format. You know, so it's... Yeah, yeah, if you no, start on this game. And my only issue with, with that, with, with these platforms, like with those type, that type of environment is I just think it's massively open to manipulation. And I, I, I don't think I, a lot of people should not take a lot of confidence in what they get. Something like what you're describing there. This, you know, you, you're coming out, you're talking to a company, they're giving a, a, an opinion of where they're at. You might be prompting them with a few questions and that's it. That's fine. But it's when I think this certainly during this crypto move and boom and the blockchain, you know, um, situation, you know, and the COVID um, uh, boom, a uh, market that we all we all experienced, which was you know particularly enjoyable. I just think some of those those groups were getting they, they were being abused and and they were doing it in a horrific way. And I genuinely think some investors, a little bit like when I started out and I looked at some of these chat forums and. Um, you know, the ADV FN and Triple I and, you know, London South East. And I genuinely believe that the people that were contributing on there were stand-up people. Well, they're not. You know, they're there to create a narrative and it's often a particularly false one to suit their own ends. And when they've got what they want out of it, you realise that, you know, the party's over. And I just feel like that there's a lot of that within that environment. And if you're coming into this, you should at least have your wits about you. So, you know, I think what you're describing sounds perfectly perfectly fine. Yeah, I think yeah. You do, you've got to stay you've got to stay honest, haven't you? You've got to stay humble in this game, particularly for me doing the most of the well, say most, all of all of the uh, the interviews for for Stockbox there, um coming at it from a impartial journalistic approach. That's very important to me, making sure that investors are getting the questions that they want answered. Um, you know, in a, in a sort of firm and, and, and fair manner, really. That's that's very important to me. So uh, I'm glad you uh, give us that feedback, Doc, and I hope we do continue for, for many years. We are certainly, I think, getting a bit more noticed out there. I think people are recognising us, and generally the feedback I get is is is, is positive. People like like the content. 
And um, yeah, we plan to to be at a few events this year. Minds and money, uh, two events coming up. The big one in November. We plan to have quite a big presence there, quite a big stand. So I'm looking forward to to that. And as long as people keep enjoying what we're doing and finding it useful and helping them to make a informed decision uh, on their investment, um, then then well, I think we're doing the right thing. We'll get Colin Bird on at Kendrick Resorts just so we can talk it up because the IPO at three and a half p and it's one and a quarter and it's a company I've been talking. I talked about on on spaces at a penny and then it was up at sort of one point one five to one point two five and a few people said, "Oh, well, you mentioned on spaces and it's gone up like fifteen percent, so there's no point buying it." And the reality was is that the spread was still pretty chunky and a thousand quid had been bought and it and it had jumped up, but you know. People like that are fantastic, aren't they? Because he'll come on. He did the most pathetic interview when it IPO'd. I mean, the, the people he put it out should be damn ashamed of themselves. And it kind of shows how much, you know, sort of enterprise the people who IPO'd it and, and the management, really. But um, And I'm not a particularly big fan, so people are sort of saying, how can you say that? You, you bought shares in Kendrick um, and, and you don't like the management. You think they're a load of, you know, sort of cock wombles. And they've done a crap job on IPO. It's been a t- epic failure. Why on earth would you go and buy the shares? Well, it's down to market mechanics, and that is they had about two point one seven million in the bank at the last set of accounts. I'm sure they spent a bit of that on on further exploration. They have got an active news period ahead. I can't see them IPOing with a load of crap news coming straight out. Um, it is one and a quarter from three and a half. Quite useful, and the market cap was three million quid with that much cash versus 7 million quid when it IPO. And Colin Bird and all of those guys, they just talk a load of pony all the time and they just find, you know, uh, enterprising ways to talk the stocks up from time to time. And I think at some point these guys are going to have to do it. And given that they've got more shares than anybody else, it's probably going to be sooner rather than later. So, yeah, uh, buying shares in a company when you hate the management, it takes me all the way back to when I used to buy shares in UK oil and gas and made a small fortune doing it too. I won't do it with this because it's only small, but still interesting don't know if you've come across them but if not give them a shout i haven't, haven't come across them no ken the, the ticker just looked it up there no yeah. kenny do you know yeah. ken kenny do you do you, do you have you heard of yeah. them i thought you'd done an interview with colin bird recently for something or maybe maybe it was something else no, I, I can't i can't remember well he's got about seven squillion direct ships hasn't he so i mean yeah, anyway look i mean Charles a nice old boy isn't he but i mean he's 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 better at talking stocks up than actually delivering projects, but, you know, I could be wrong. He might have been successful once upon a time, but no. Now then, Zach, great to be here with the new IPO. We're going to hit the ground running, three and a half P down to one. <laughs> Tell you what, Cole, you've done a shite job there, fella. But anyway, you know, I bought shares in the company, so I'm, I'm the worst promoter when it comes. <laughs> but it's working, uh, it's working for me. Mike, there's, there's probably plenty of IPOs in the last 12 to 18 months that are probably in a similar trajectory. So, yeah. It's, I'm, it's, sure, I'm, I'm sure they are, Ken, but then the, one of the things that we have discussed on, on Twitter Spaces Live is, you know, they should have an obligation to come out and at least answer shareholders. You know, one of the things that really grips my shit, Ken, is, look, you've got me at that swear box now, so it seems like you've unlocked me again from that the foul mouth, you know, rants. But, you know, one of the things that grips my shit is when direct, look... <laughs> We know the market's pretty bad, but we come out and just acknowledge it. Look, we come to market at a particularly challenging time, but we did raise a decent sum of cash. We do believe we're gonna we're gonna do something material with this business and we're working tirelessly to get it done. Not come out and do some of these poxy, horrific kind of stage managed performance. It's just it's too transparent. People don't like it. And let the price tells you that as well. So I'm not I'm not disagreeing, but then at least be at least have the the courtesy to come and at least comment and talk about it. I, I'm sick of these directors who they only want to sing when they're winning. You know, there's a whole bunch of them across the market. Come out when you're down on your luck and at least put your hands up and say, you know what, we, we brought the project at the wrong time, but we the market will come back round and this is why and this is what we'll do. And we've got sufficient cash to get us from A to B. Don't worry, you know. And, and apologies that this has happened. Nobody ever does it, do they? They just start chirping. When the shares have got, you know, a bit like Ben's Creek, they'll start chirping when the shares are 60, 80, 100p, and then suddenly you find the major shareholders are selling shares under 20p. Don't ever hear that Wilson guy coming out talking about that, do you? It just, it's just pathetic. But anyway, look, um, I've probably not done myself any favours, really, because I'm a shareholder in Kendrick now, and uh, <laughs> probably nobody want to buy it thinking Colin's a lion's But at the end of the day, I, look, I, 
It's all about market mechanics, and you can make money even buying bad companies poorly run if you get it right in the cycle. And I think we've, you know, I think we're there, and the, the liquidity across the junior market tells us that's the case. Yeah, yeah, that does does tons of some one million companies. So there is in the market now, and there's going to be a few more because I, I mean, I've been seeing it for months and months, but I've not really seen the selling season yet. I've not, I think I've seen maybe two placings that you know. It's a 30, 40. In fact, I think one was even 50% discount to, to the current share price. Uh, usually, you know, when you get, a, a, you know, seven or eight of them in a couple of weeks, that's a, definitely the bottom, bottom of the market. But companies must be. Mate, I think we've seen the bottom of the market now, Ken. You know, I'm seeing deals all, well, all the time. And you reckon those discounts yeah. aren't as big as they used to be. And they're performing now. They're going up instead of down when they do the yeah. deals. I mean, fuck. <laughs> even fast it's, resources are raising huge sums of. Cash haven't gone up five hundred percent. I mean, you know, when you're seeing crap start to surface like that, it's a sign that there's a turnaround underway. Yeah, the only thing, the explanation I can give is that maybe COVID just forced companies to streamline their businesses and make them more efficient. And obviously, the cash has lasted longer than uh, than what the usual cycle would allow them to to last. So you may be right. You know, we might not see that silly season uh, and. Whilst, whilst the silly season is terrible for existing shareholders, you know, if you're if you're fortunate enough to get in that placing, you know, it's uh, it can be an opportunity. But like I say, I've only seen I one. I see everybody two. getting all gas now because Upland Resources are doing a fundraise. I mean, they've done really well, by the way. They've raised some money at 0.25. Shares went up to sort of like 0. 0.75, 0. 0.8. They've softened last week down to, I think, 0.55. And then, you know, they've announced that they've done a small premium rate. Well, you know, the raise is at a small premium at 0.6 with warrants at 1.2p uh, yeah. for 1.75 million quid. So, you know, that, that seems to be going well and the market seems to like it. Um, I believe there's a couple of big tickets gone in there. So that'll be, you know, that'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Uh, but, you know, everybody's everybody's thrilled with Upland with a, you know, four, five, six, seven million quid market cap. And then... Little old Longboat Energy announced that they've got a couple of blocks out in Malaysia themselves. Very credible management team. Nine million pound market cap, nine million quid of cash. They have got a discovery uh, or a number of discoveries in Norway. Um, they've said that they'll look to commercialise them or do some sort of a, some business to develop them. And these guys, you know, they've got nine million in cash. They only IPO did ten. So you know, the kind of commercial people, and they've got a lot of support. They've got deals with you know Equinor. DNO, DNO were the people who took out Faro Petroleum, which this management team run before Longboat. And it just it blows me away to think that it's trading at 6, 15, 16 P. I've watched it come down from 20, 21 when I was buying it at a bit of a run, and it's now 16 P. I'm absolutely staggered. I think it's a great opportunity. But you know, it seems that people yeah. like the, the story in Upland. And I'm not saying you should sell Upland and buy these, but what I'm saying is on a value basis, there's got to be a point where you kind of say, well. You know, the ex-management team from Faro, who sold out to DNO for 800 million quid, are, are still operating in Norway where, you know, the expertise, their expertise lie. And they've taken some, you know, exploration in Malaysia, which is suddenly starting to get interesting. And they can't get a break. So I think there's value. I think there's value across some of these opportunities. Yeah, just when you're talking about oil and gas, it was interesting to see that. I mean, actually, we're speaking to them tomorrow. It was interesting to see Corsell seem to be you know, they've got a new, new sort of strategic direction and they're looking to get into some oil and gas stuff. Uh, I think one of the focuses is going to be on Brazil as well. So I'm looking forward to speaking to Scott tomorrow just to, just to pick his brains to, to see what that's all about. Uh, just well, I can tell you now, stuff. Brazil's open for business. So, you know, you look at uh, you look at things that are going on in Brazil. Um, there was a company that IPO'd on, in Canada, Bravo Mining, 160 million race, 170 million race, 40. 35 million raised, non-broker. It's doubled in price since it listed. Brazil's open for business, so I think that's a great jurisdiction to be looking at. Um, interests me that, you know, like Corsell and Coro and these companies, they were all going from the black to blue to green energy and they've quickly now gone from green to blue back to black, um, which is fascinating. But, you know, Parsons, you can never rule him out and he's involved with them. So, you know, it'd be interesting to see whether they can get something done. Um, they don't seem to be able to move their existing portfolio very quickly, certainly over the last couple of years, they've been poor. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, I think Brazil's a great place for them to look. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll find out tomorrow because we've got Scott on the podcast. So, should be good, Mark. 
Interfaith. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, it'd be good to see what's going on with with, uh, with Corsell. I mean, I did like uh, what I was seeing there with the the projects they had. Those uh, battery energy storages, but a few of them haven't really hasn't really happened. Um, did, did, didn't they do a deal recently with um, with uh, one of their big assets? Do you remember, Kenny? Uh, uh, well, we've got a rare earth project now. So oh, they, yes, they, it's the rare earth project they brought in. That's it. Yeah. 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 Right. So there was in fact there was some news in that this morning as well. So. Yeah, it'll be good to pick his brains and then just see what, what the what the way ahead is. And again, I mean, sell share price has been has been trash, like the same as many others in the space. So, yeah, there'll be an opportunity there. Uh, it's certainly after tomorrow. <laughs> and then you look at something like Prospects Energy, which we talked about a good few years ago, and they get rid of the management team because you know the shareholders or the big shareholders get a little bit sick of the same old nonsense. You know the the management team doing spivvy fundraisers with crappy, uninspiring bucket shops in the city, and uh, you know shareholders get enough of the company to say, actually, no, we're not going to, we don't want you to carry on with that. We want you to try and develop what we've got with the funds that we've got. And and suddenly, you know, I mean, I actually put a quite controversial for me now. It wouldn't have been a, a few years ago. Put a, a tweet out and said, I didn't realise it got to 50 million market cap and, I, and I'd be selling them. Shares were 20p. They just announced that they'd done a, an offtake agreement with BP or subsidiary of BP on the, on the gas in Italy. And that kind of rubbed up some of the prospects, people the wrong way. But And, and the shares have softened. You know, They've gone from 20, 20 and a half down to 15p. But amazing to think that if you force the value out of these companies by saying to management, no, we're not going to stand for this. And, and that's what some of the major shareholders did. Changed the management team, stuck with uh, a difficult jurisdiction in Italy, you know, tough bureaucracy, and actually get that 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 sell the gas field up and running and producing. And now you've got offtakes, 40 million pound market cap. I mean, Jesus Christ, there were 50 last week. I remember having 3% of this. <laughs> I've, I've given away a fortune, just under 3% I had. So there we go. That's what happens when your patient expires. But it's great to see. It's great to see companies like that, you know, little companies that have had a torrid time of it. So again, you know, for anybody who's looking at Corsell or Coral or any of these little things, Mosman, Canadian overseas, you know, you can hate what's gone on, you can hate the history, or you can or you can learn to love the future. And that's what's happened with prospects. And those that's gone up to 50 million quid. Amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, even even Nostra falls in that bracket as well. It's, it's down to totally. the at, at the moment. So I think it's at 0.25 or something, just from memory. I've not even, I've not looked for a It's been the wrong price for ages, but I think, you know, Matt must just feel like pulling his teeth out. I mean, he bangs his head against the wall and, you know, there's always some smart ass who says, you know, I invested my life savings in 2017 and I wouldn't invest. You know, and there's always some someone who's got a comment to make. I'm, I've done all right out of Nostra over the years. I've not done as well as I could have done, but I've done all right. You know, you buy them at the, you buy them at the bottom, you loosen a few offers, they start going. They always have a big move every every 12, 18 months. It's probably due at any minute now. So, Ken, I think you probably nailed it. Um, yeah, it's, de- it's definitely it's point two two in the, in the bed, so it is. Uh, yeah, no, if it... If it went to the point two. I'm not, to be honest, I'm not really doing a lot of trading or anything at the moment. I've not really been doing a lot for the last probably eighteen months. Hence, why I'm not as probably as knowledgeable as you. You know what's what's going on in the sector, uh, mainly because I've not got the time. Uh, so, so it's yeah, it's it's probably probably now is the time we should be looking. Maybe spending a focus three or four hours just picking out. You know, five, well, there's a little company days. called Capital Metals that we invested in, and, and things didn't yeah. work out. Um, they they had a license suspended. There were some issues with the structure of the vehicle in Sri Lanka. Of course, you know the Sri Lankan government collapsed. Um, I think the political geopolitical situation has been you know desperate. Um, I'm not a big fan of of what Mike's done, Mike Frame, with that company. I think it's been poor. Again, I think you know. Certain things have happened that were unavoidable, and there's nothing he could have done about it. And there's other things that he could have. But they've, I, I get another one that was covered on the podcast and on the live saying, really disappointed with this. Uh, do understand that you can't you can't legislate for certain things that happen at government level, or you know your country almost collapses and <laughs> or collapses. There's not a lot you can do. Uh, but there, you know, there's other things that he could have done proactively beforehand. They've now managed to uh, get the licenses. 
uh, restructure the company and they're hopeful that those licenses will be returned to them and they can get on and start developing the business. Shares have gone from two and a half to four and a half. Um, I, I didn't have the confidence to buy them, but it was one that was flagged up uh, along with a bunch of different companies and it's performed. So again, that was just the value of getting on, you know, being on that live, talking to different people and picking out these companies. You know, do you remember that one? Yeah, I do. And, and then talking about it. So yeah, yeah, no, there's a whole bunch of them. Yeah, I suppose I suppose a good example of what can happen with some of these these stocks. If you look at Prem, you know Prem was tr- trading at 0. 0.04 of a pence, maybe what, I yeah, don't know, 16, 17 months ago. No, I think it's at an all time high today. I think it's 0. 0.73, but not an all time high. All time high in market cap. Uh, um, I think uh, so. Yeah, I mean that's probably what is the market cap of Prem? I mean, I don't. It says it was like when I watched that that Ben's Creek thing. I mean, it just got it got hell raising. But then we've seen it with other companies. It, they can go higher, but it's mad when they get into like hundreds of millions, and you think, oh, geez. Yeah, Prem is uh, two hundred one hundred and sixty one million. So it is. I mean, it can still go higher though. It can can't still it? go higher. Yeah, one hundred and sixty. It sounds a lot, but you know, it, it can go. Yeah, I've seen. I mean, it, switched on the Prem, aren't you, Mark? You're quite aware of what's going on. So obviously, you. are You've had George on quite a few yeah, times. Yeah, George has been on quite a few times. I mean, I'm uh, I followed the story. I mean, not for not I know the company's been around a very long time and George Roach has a, a, a checkered history, let's say, with lots of investors. But I only really came it came into my focus really, yeah, maybe three or so years ago when I started interviewing him. And uh, that's really where the most of the developments happened, I think, particularly with uh, with Lith- Zulu Lithium there and how that's really gone from almost being not not going very far, considering even moving it on to, to actually getting it into production. And I mean, that that's a remarkable story to follow. I know it's had a lot, a lot of history, but in the last two, three years, it's really advanced a heck of a way. And to be fair to George and the team there, to get to get that into pilot plant production imminently, I suppose, um, is fantastic. It's a great story to follow. And uh, you know, it doesn't stop there after the pilot plant. And all being well, I'm going to go out to see them um, not long after, or hopefully around the time that they actually go live on their pilot pump production. It'd be the first site visit. Actually, no, that's a lie. Zimbabwe, I, I did, yeah. I did Boxing do a yourself site. in Zimbabwe. Nope, off to Zim, yeah, that's the plan. Yeah, it's not booked in yet. But that is the uh, that is the plan, to get to Zimbabwe, get on site Stay and uh, see what's going on. Rolex watch, Mark. That's all I'm going to say. Don't I, don't, I don't own a Rolex watch, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's, anyway, it's, it's look, gone really well, that, that company has. George has gone from, like, you know, that nasty granddad that, you know... Makes you sit on his lap and inappropriately touch it. So now being the friendliest granddad, at the, you know, in the world, and could probably play, probably play Santa Claus because you know he's, he's totally revolutionised and turned it around. You know, the, the most in, interesting thing is how much it trades. I mean, Christ, yeah. I mean, it's so liquid. Or it's I've seen it when I've been observing, and it's super active. Loads going on. He could probably raise a small fortune with it, and that's why I think you know, that market cap could go higher because I think somebody's going to look at it and, and just from, forget the project, they're just going to look at that and go, shit, that's that's a machine, it's just a cash yeah. cow. Yeah, yeah. Even even when the share price was at 0.04 pence stock, it was, it was still hella yeah. liquid. You know, it was trading on I know, it's crazy, pounds. isn't it? I mean, that, I was that was I was in and out quite a few times, you know, when it was like zero point zero four, and it would get to about 5.5 or something, you would just flip it out and it seemed... I, I reckon if you had the time and you could mark the cycles and frame at that point, you could probably have made that quite a bit of money, uh, just because it was it was so liquid. But it's interesting though because they're not just a one trick pony. They've got the there's a it's an RHA Thompson from memory as well, which is quite advanced, and they've mm-hmm. got a couple of other uh, investments and in, uh, gold projects. I think there's one in Mozambique as well. Can't remember what that is, but I mean there's quite a lot going on in there, so they could potentially. Uh, I mean, I suppose, I suppose it's a takeover target as well, isn't it? When you think about it. I mean, if they start producing... Uh, you see that little pram there, don't you, in Zimbabwe, flying, and then freaking I've had a load of money parked in Contango. I can't seem to get a break with them. <laughs> <laughs> and they're in, they're in Zimbabwe too. And, and you know, they've had the wash plant now delivered to site. You know, they'll be producing, they'll be spitting out some cash. And, I mean, they don't seem to talk much about the gold assets in Mali maybe because I think that... The, uh, they don't want to confuse investors with the messaging. You know, the focus is, is where the value of the money is right now. And there's 
future value in, in those other assets. Just crazy. Just can't seem to get out the blocks. They raised seven and a half million quid and the market was really tough at 6p. They've never raised money at a discount to the previous round um, and they still can't get a break. I just don't know what to say. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm Go up there, Mark, and have a look and see what Carl's doing. Tell him to get his thumb out of his ass. And get <laughs> well, when I'm in Zimbabwe, can see Contango. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you might as well, yeah. While you're there, just pop across. And... Pop across. <laughs> and, and have you, know, a quick word. you know how it works, Doc. Something left field will happen. Something you don't expect. There'll be some, some bit of news that you don't think will, will make any difference to the market. And it, it just sets it in fire. It's, it's, kind of, it's funny how the markets work. You know, there's, there's no set pattern. And even now, it, in these times, you know, post COVID, etc., and it's I, I I don't think it's ever going to be the same. I don't think you could ever you could ever you know look, well you can look back historically, but I, I just think the mechanics are constantly changing. The landscape's constantly changing now in the markets. People are smarter. People are more informed. There's more tools available to access them. Access to a lot more technology, haven't they? You know, we can do these Telegram groups. You can do this Twitter Spaces Live. You can. You can tap right into them. It's it's pretty much why some of these guys who who run on you know uh, aging reputations were able to sit in companies forever and get away with it. You know, there was people who were running these companies that had worked as a uh, can lad. And if you don't know what a can lad is, market somebody who makes tea and coffee for the workers. Uh, but yeah, you get these people who who you know if, if, oh, I was a can lad at, uh, at Glencore or. You know, they, I mean, they don't say that. They say, you know, ch- operations assistant to the, you know, and em- being emptier, uh, and they run on that, and they and they get in these little small cap companies, and they stand there in snazzy little suits and do these presentations, and in their resume, it looks really interesting that they work for a big market cap company, and they just sit on aim for 15, 20 years, doing nothing but draining money out of firms, and they're just uninspiring, unmotivating uh, assholes who can't deliver anything. Um, probably couldn't even. Anyway, I, I won't. I'll, I'll end it at that. But the point is, is that's changed now. So you know, we're getting to see the whites of people's eyes. We're getting under the hood. People can start really digging into backgrounds, and so of course, the questions that start to to surface are more challenging to deal with. And, and I think technology's done that, Ken. And you're right; it is. It's a forever changing environment. And uh, yeah, I think we're going to see some interesting changes in the future. And if Mark's now going to start turning up on Saturday, I remember about five years ago, I had that I, 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 an ambition of doing this, by the way, Mark, is turning up and actually interviewing companies. And I, I wasn't going to pay to get there myself, but I wasn't going to charge for, for my time either. Just wanted to, my plan was when I've made loads and loads of cash, I'm just going to travel around doing this. Um, so now you're doing it, which is fantastic. Maybe we do it together. Maybe we do it together, hey. I mean, I think um, it, it, we kind of come back to where we started on this. I used to think you were a nonce, but now I think you, you know, you're a friendly granddad. I don't think he'll welcome me on site, do you? I'll probably get <laughs> you know, shot dead by a couple of... No, I'm sure he'll be, he'll be, sure be fine. We might, we might make, a good, make a, good, a good duo. I don't know. But I do think that uh, there could be a lot of these coming up in the future, you know, these kind of trips, because I do feel that the, the money is really going to come back to this sector in, in a huge way. I think we're going to see a huge boom boom time. I'm not quite sure it's here yet, and that's why I was interested to know why you thought you, you we'd kind of seen the, the bottom. Maybe what signs are you seeing? Because I, I think we might still see some pain to go through. I mean, uh, Kenny said earlier he's not been buying lack of use a lack of time. I'm not buying just because I don't see great value at the minute. I'm sort of, you know, I have companies on my watch list that I think could be good value particularly in the mining exploration space, particularly in gold, but but just not yet. I just feel there's still uh, some, uh, you know, some, there's a lot of liquidity to come out of the market. I'm actually, we talked about Tesla earlier. I actually have a big short out on Tesla. I think that's going to fall quite a lot. So I just wonder why, I mean, I, I think we all agree that the mining sector is going to have a huge boom one day, uh, well, one day very soon. Um, but what, what signs are you saying that you think it's sort of like now rather than, you know, a bit later? <laughs> Because, because the because if the general consensus is, um, you know, interest rates have been hiked, inflation um, or hyperinflation issues and all these other things, then then surely what should happen is uh, equities should start to, you know, roll over. Uh, people are going potentially put the cash into the bank because now you can go, and, as I have, open an account with Chase, thanks to my mate Taza on Twitter, uh, open an account with Chase now and you can get 2.75%. You don't have to do anything. You can put up to half a million quid in and they calculate it weekly or daily and pay it weekly and you get a little nice little bit of interest which nobody's had. So, of course, the, th- the theory is more money is going to start moving away than coming in. 
But what we know historically is whatever that general consensus is, if 95% of people are telling you to go along with natural gas, you probably shouldn't. <laughs> and I was one of those 95 that thought at uh, whatever it was, well, I think I'm 200 pips offside at the minute. Um, yeah, I should go along with natural gas because it's fallen to 17-month lows and it's you know it's collapsed. Well, guess what? Everybody else thought that and it went even lower. And when everybody thinks that, something is going to happen in the market. It nearly always doesn't happen that way. It's the timing, which mm. is the difficult thing. It's the timing. You know, I can say, well, I think I think there's going to be a, a, a black swan event or a, it'll be a catalyst, something from the left field, as Kenny describes, that happens, which starts to trigger that small cap market. But I don't know when it's going to happen. And in the meantime, yeah, we can see, you know, more pain. But I don't know. I just think that if everybody thinks that that's going to happen, it can't possibly happen because we know that 95% of people in the market get it wrong, which is, you know, why there's such a small community of people that can be, you know, continually successful at doing what we do. Yeah, it's interesting you're talking about natural gas here, Mark. You did an interesting interview with a company that's due to IPO in a couple of weeks, or maybe maybe a month or so. A little bit longer, you, yeah, yeah. Hydrogen, helium, and and natural gas. Yeah, that, yeah, that's right. Yeah, the helium I think is more the the focus than the, than the nat gas. But um, yeah, now. Georgina Energy, that's actually one to take a look at, Doc, and value your uh, opinion on that. But they uh, come into market soon, natural gas, well, let's say helium, hydrogen, and, and natural gas projects in, in Australia. Uh, they are uh, capped well. Yeah, go, so go and have a look at the last company they tried to list and see what happens. Well, the last, co- what the, the directors tried to list? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It didn't work out. Maybe ask them. Maybe these. I mean, look, you've got the, you've got it in advance now. So what you could say is, you know, this happened. This we do these interviews, and the market commentator was there, and this is what he said. And there was there was definitely. I, I'd, I'd have to go back and look at it, but there was definitely either company that they were involved in that never got to market, or they were, they come to market with some assets and a big project looking to raise ten million or you know a decent sum of cash, and they never got it. People didn't want to back it. They weren't interested, and they just dropped those assets. Started again, raise some more money for a new idea, and and then they come back again a few years later. So, uh, for me, it's like, well, if you if they were great ideas, <laughs> if it was a great idea a few years ago, why did you drop it and start to do this? It's as if it's as if they're just jumping on trend, and if they're jumping on trend whilst it's happening, it's very difficult for it to work out. If they're jumping on trend before the event, um, then it could work out, and if that's the case, then maybe what the guy says is. Well, you know, we looked at this. We realised that we're jumping on a trend that was coming to an end. We didn't want to, you know, we didn't want to overpay, or we, we didn't want to um, try and force a square into a, a peg into a round hole. And we think this hydrogen uh, deal is fantastic, and this is why. And, and maybe they'll be honest about it. But they're the kind of things that most people, like you said, even yourself, um, unless you've spent hours like a total nerd, like I've done in in the past, looking into these things. Um, Nobody ever knows about it, but that that group definitely, or some of them that are involved in it, definitely had a, a bright idea a few years ago that didn't work. So I would be interested to see what they say. And I'll tell you what, if they come across well and it comes out right, then maybe I'm a buyer in the IPO or in the, in the aftermarket. Yeah, well, there's some homework for you, Martin. Martin. I feel like I've been a bit of a miserable prick today on some of these companies, and I don't really want to, you know. I kind of I want to give everything a fair go, but... Yeah, maybe you just what? got out on the wrong side of bed. Sorry, boys. It's, it's, it's Monday. It's pouring rain in Scotland. It's cold, windy, miserable. Yeah, it's got that kind of feeling. So it has. I need. <laughs> I, I think I need to join the Monday Club. Do you know what the Monday Club is, Mark? It's maybe a Scottish term. No, no, um, it's not. It's not Kenny. It's where everyone goes above and gets steaming drunk in the afternoon, isn't it? Yeah, so basically, it's just it's a it's a cure for the the weekend. If you've been on it all weekend and you can't. You still need four or five pints, then you go for the money. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, to ease you into the week. Um, yeah, but sometimes uh, you, jo- you join the Monday club and then you have all the Tuesday off, and then there's football on the Wednesday, and then oh, fuck it, it's Thursday. And then before you know it, you're, you're back into it. So it becomes a six day cycle. You only have one day off. Ah, the best thing to do is, is if you actually just you know start to look at how function alcoholics make numerous excuses for why they keep doing what they're doing you'll find all of these little phrases that both kenny and i have discussed today i'm not saying kenny's a functional alcoholic and i'm certainly not but we do both enjoy a decent bevy um and therefore that's what that's what these monday clubs are and 
Friday tea time. You've got to have a pint on a Friday tea. And if you've been working and you're having a late one, you know, we'll have a dust buster. And there's a thousand terms for why people who get pissed get pissed. And actually, there's no real excuse for it, to be perfectly frank. Okay. Yeah. Well, on that... So uh... won't stop me having a dust buster on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, on that note, maybe we should uh, we should we should uh, we should leave it there for now. I mean, we're nearly up on an hour. We could keep going, I'm sure, for a little bit longer. But uh, I'll try and hit your spaces, Doc, and continue the conversation over there at, uh, at some point. But thank you very much for for joining us again. Always a pleasure, never a chore, to, to speak to you. Thanks, mate. Well, there we are. Kenny, go and get go and get a bit of Monday Club down. You know, yeah, keep doing what you do. And I think there's good good argument with. This uh, this this Twitter analytics thing now. I mean, I've, if I was you boys, I'd be I'd be smashing this in front of every CEO that never wanted to do an interview with you and chose one of these two bit poxy platforms and say, well, look, maybe you want to have a rethink about that. Oh, uh, um, Tango could be one of them. We're casting plenty of worms. Don't worry. Well, good. Uh, well, uh, yeah, time is now definitely. Definitely, I think that try and be a bit more cheery and chipper next time, gents. Um, I, again, I, I think you know, there's there's no downside to knowledge is power, and you know, knowledge is, is important. Um, I don't want anybody to to just be closing thoughts here. Sorry, lads. Uh, you know, I don't want people to go, well, oh, you know, George, Georgina, or George, you know, energy are coming and he pointed something out from the past. We've all got past and we've all made mistakes. I'm not. You know, I don't want to start hammering companies before they even get into the marketplace. Just be interested in revealing if some of these guys have actually just disclosed it or come out and, and spoke about it. But you know, it, like I say, I'm not, I'm not always been particularly kind about old uh, Brewer. But you know, he come on, he was fantastic. I thought he come across particularly well and and good on him. You know, and that's and we need that. We just need that two way dialogue. And maybe I've just been a bit a bit pessimistic on a few things today. So apologies. And a bit like Kendrick. You don't have to like the management. You don't even have to think that they're going to they're going to deliver a project in three or five years' time. You just have to know that market mechanics are what drives a market up. And if they want to raise any money in the future, we've got to get the price up. And if the you know if they want anyone to take them serious, so they can legitimately try to deliver the project or run as a lifestyle company for the next three to five years, they've got to start you know stimulating the secondary market. And on that basis, I was a buyer of them. Oh, little old Chesterfield Resources. Their deal fell over with uh, Pacton. I, I won't get, go into the details. I'm aware of what happened. Really, really bad. Really sad. So one of the directors within the Pacton group had a horrendous experience that has pretty much debilitated them as a board from getting some things done. I don't think there's anything wrong with the company. I just think they've run into some pretty bad situation or a bad situation. Yeah, and therefore, Chest Chesterfield have thrown their hands up and said, look... We've got to get on and get something done. So they've still got their asset over in Newfoundland and Labrador. And I believe there's another suitor on the table to do a deal. That'll get announced. They've retained the stuff in Cyprus. Um, with this tiny little market cap, I think they go higher. than I still I still think they do three or four P, but yeah, maybe one to consider or look at. Or... Yeah, then, of course, they had that, that FTSE 100 company buying, the, what was it, 12 pence or something from memory? I can't remember, 12, 14 it was pence? It was nine or eight, I think it was, but the shares traded, you know, double that. So polymetallic was, it was the yeah. uh, FTSE 100 um, mining company, was it seventh biggest mining company in the world? I think they were all listed, seventh biggest listed company um, in the sector, something like that. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that whole that whole Russia-Ukraine thing's, you know, done F Raz and Polly and a few other bits and pieces in. And um, yeah, those guys are still in. Those guys still own 20% of it. So I think they're, they're on a sub two million pound market cap. Last time I spoke to them, they've got about half a million quid. And I think they'll do a deal that brings a little bit of cash and uh and, and paper in a, in a in a business. And if not, they've got a they've got an asset sitting on the book that the Canadian firm packed and were prepared to pay four and a half million dollars for aside from anything else that they've got, including the cash, the listing, and the stuff in Cyprus. So I would take a, you know, a guess that it should at least see 50, 100% gain from 1.5, 1.6p. But 
yeah, I've been wrong before. Uh, the argument, I'm sure somebody's going to say, that's not a lot of cash, they're going to raise money. Well, the standard list, so they've got 20% headroom, they can't really raise a lot of money, so they need the price up before they can raise, so they've got to do something. Um, yeah. Or it's a prospectus job, which is uh, never any good. So that was it, that's, that's me, definitely. done. Um, thanks for your time. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Thank you both for your time. And yeah, let's speak again soon, though. Let's not leave it too long. Okay, cheers, right. Jets. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to another podcast from Market Musings with Fairbairn and Russell. Tune in next time.